Welcome back once again to the Pager Podcast. In this episode, we jump back into the world of medical ethics for a thoughtful discussion with Dr. Zoe Fritz. This focuses on resuscitation in healthcare settings and advanced care planning. Dr. Fritz is a consultant in acute medicine at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. She's also a Wellcome Trust Fellow in Society and Ethics. Now, the starting point for our discussion is a process that Dr. Fritz led the development of called RESPECT, the Recommended Summary Plan for Emergency Care and Treatment. The RESPECT process aims to facilitate more personalised discussions with patients surrounding the care that they would like to receive in the future, for example, in the case of an emergency. We talk about what motivated Dr. Fritz's work in this area in the first place, and the limitations and indeed misapplications of DNA CPR forms, which the RESPECT process also seeks to address. We talk about research into how DNA CPR decisions can be used inappropriately to justify reduced care uh, in other areas, Um, public perceptions of CPR, and the importance of having honest conversations about escalation of care, discussing potential outcomes, and what could constitute a good or a poor outcome for an individual. This leads us on to talking about everything from why fears of upsetting patients surrounding discussions of future care may be somewhat overemphasised and the importance of actually how these conversations are conducted in the first place, as well as the role of a clinician's judgement in determining what treatments are likely to be effective or not. We also dive into the ethics surrounding best interest decisions and to what extent a patient's best interests can represent the interests of another individual, for example, a family member. It's a fascinating episode with so much relevance to modern medicine Um, and I hope that you enjoy it. As ever, we would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts, comments, or ideas relating to any of our episodes. So do get in touch at Pager Podcast, that's on Twitter or Instagram, or via email at pagerpodcast at gmail.com. Then Dr. Fritz, thanks so much for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure to finally have you on the podcast. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I wanted to start off just by asking you about some of the work that you've been doing um, relating to respect and actually what motivated that work in the first place? I was a junior doctor and I think maybe as so often is the case the best thing to do is tell you about two kind of case case patients that I had two kind of index cases that started me thinking that the way we were doing things was unethical actually and that really we needed to question our current practice. So the first patient was a very sweet, very frail, 92 or 93 year old lady who came in on a Friday night with a pneumonia. And um, I remember very clearly I was in recess. She was really quite poorly. I'd started her on antibiotics. I'd given her a little bit of fluid, all the kind of general medical stuff. But I looked at her and um, this is at a time where you didn't have to discuss CPR with patients. I didn't think that she would survive attempted CPR. Uh, She had very little muscle mass. She was just one of those very frail bird-like ladies. Mm. On the other hand, um, I did think she might get over this acute admission with her pneumonia. And I wanted to make sure that if she needed to go to intensive care overnight, then she would go to intensive care, have a chance for the antibiotics to work. And so I got out of this DNA CPR form and I wrote all over it, not for research, but for consideration of ICU, please call doctor if she deteriorates, all this kind of extra stuff to try and indicate that she should still be for other treatments. Because I realized... I was concerned that the DNA CPR would be interpreted as do not escalate. And the nurses really laughed at me because this form was more my writing than it was the basic form. And I thought a DNA CPR is too blunt an instrument to indicate all the things that we want. It's too easy to misunderstand that this shouldn't mean don't escalate, don't take too intensive care. It, it, it doesn't indicate what we're trying to achieve with a patient. It just says don't do something. So that really kind of stuck with me. And then I moved on to another hospital and I came on a night shift and I said, uh, who are the sick patients I need to know about? And the outgoing outreach nurse said, oh, there are quite a few sickies, but they're all DNA CPR. And I said, I still need to see them just because they're DNA CPR doesn't mean I didn't see them. And the outgoing registrar said, DNAR, doesn't that mean doesn't need another review? And he was joking. He was, I mean, he was being humorous, but it just indicated that this was a very prevalent problem. So I would say the thing that first got me interested was this feeling that when you wrote a DNA CPR, patients were being written off. And then I ended up 
um, with the support of Jonathan Ford, doing a whole program of research into looking at how DNA CPRs could be misunderstood to mean that other care should be withheld. The first paradigm shift was this idea that instead of just talking about treatment to be withheld, do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Instead, we should be thinking about overall goals of care. We should be thinking about what it is we were trying to achieve with the patient. And, um, and that then would lead to what were the kind of treatments that we would give. And then the CPR decision would only be a tiny bit of what was documented. And we trialed that with a before and after study um, and contemporaneous case controls. And we found that just the small shift meant that patients got improved care, or at least they got reduced harm. So we were able to show that they were less likely to acquire hospital acquired infection or get pressure sores, they were less likely, they were more likely to be escalated in the middle of the night. So it kind of, it dealt with the initial problem, but it didn't deal so much with the conversations that doctors were having with patients. Because at that point in the UK, it was still not a legal requirement to discuss CPR with patients. And that changed with a legal case you're probably familiar with, that of uh, Janet Tracy, where it became a legal requirement for doctors to discuss CPR with patients unless they thought it would cause physiological or psychological harm. So once that happened, then a second paradigm shift could happen because then doctors had to discuss CPR. And we were saying, well, not only should they discuss CPR, but they should be discussing goals of care. And so then I would say the second paradigm shift that happened with respect was, well, we're going to start this conversation by asking a patient what's really important to you. What outcomes are we trying to achieve? And what outcomes are we frightened of? And that I talk a lot about establishing shared understanding between patient mm. and clinician. And to me, the respect paradigm is about establishing a shared understanding first between the patient and clinician of the patient's condition. Because if you're coming at it from different angles, you have no chance of then making a shared plan together. And um, unfortunately, quite often, patients and doctors have had conversations at cross purposes because a doctor might say, for example, um, I'm afraid we, you know, only palliative chemotherapy is available now. And the patient will understand that that means they cannot be cured from their disease. Or a doctor might say, your heart failure means you probably won't be able to leave the house again comfortably without being breathless. And they don't understand that means they probably have less than six months to live. So it's a complete problem of doctors that we use these euphemisms or we talk around mm. things in a poor way. But the first step of the respect process is to say, let's establish a shared understanding of what the diagnosis is, what the current quality of life that patient is, what they think of it. Um, and then you can move on to, okay, well, what are the outcomes you value? What are the outcomes you fear? And again, it's the clinician learning from the patient, getting a shared understanding from the patient of what it is that they want to achieve. And I've had patients say things to me like, um, very happy, to continue in that be housebound, um, very continue, very happy to continue to need care so long as I've got my marbles, so long as I can recognize my grandchildren, that's what's most mm. important to me. And I've had other people say to me, um, I don't want a dwindling death or a lingering death. If my time comes, let me go quickly. I absolutely don't want to be physically dependent. And actually just asking those questions instead of like, would you like invasive ventilation? What do you think about dialysis? I think it's a much more important question to get from the patient what outcomes they value, what outcomes they fear. And once the clinician has that, then they kind of lead the conversation a bit and say, well, in the context of me understanding that what you really fear is a lingering death and that you really value keeping your, um, your marbles, as you put it, um, I would say we should give you all the treatments on the ward. We should stop you from ever needing to go to intensive care. But if you were to become very sick from a pneumonia, then I think you probably wouldn't benefit from a ventilator given your heart failure or whatever it is that this patient has, um, and we shouldn't attempt CPR. And so you're explaining, you're establishing then a shared understanding of what treatments they would or wouldn't benefit from. So it's a kind of three-stage process of shared understanding. In the first two, you're making sure you really understand where the patient's coming from, and at the third point, the clinician is, is trying to make sure the patient understands why they're making the clinical recommendations. And I think, uh, in my own experience, that has led to much more fulfilling conversations with patients. It doesn't feel sometimes quite uncomfortable, I think, for a doctor to have a DNA CPR conversation because it's just about withholding something. And it sounds almost quite arbitrary. And we've seen in the CQC report yesterday um, that there have been lots of examples of it being quite arbitrary. <laughs> Doctors just unfortunately making you know massive decisions about CPR without thinking about the individual patient. And uh, the philosophy around respect or behind respect is that it has to be an individualized 
patient-centered decision and it has to be about establishing shared understanding of the patient's condition shared understanding of the patient's values and then shared understanding of the clinical recommendations for that patient and i definitely like to go on to talk a bit about how we study communicating these decisions and the information about this and um, the uncertainty involved but i wanted to first ask why you don't think that this has happened earlier we seem to have had this dichotomy between this uh, these two very separate treatment pathways of everything or nothing um because at the face of it dna cpr is almost what it says on the tin it is a it's about one particular intervention in response to one particular um event which leaves a whole host of other possible avenues that haven't been discussed at all so i think that's an excellent question i think cpr was treated differently than other treatments for two reasons the first is that it's what I would call the final common pathway. All of us, our heart is going to stop at some point. So it's a treatment that is going to be relevant to all of us at some point or other or not. Whereas we don't all need to decide about whether we want to have bowel surgery, right? Like we don't all fortunately get bowel cancer, but all of our hearts are going to stop 100%. Um, RD Lang said, life is a sexually transmitted condition and the mortality is 100%. So, you know, that it is going to happen. And, and so I think it therefore always is very resonant for people to think about CPR because everybody can identify with the fact that at some point their heart is going to stop, their parents' hearts are stopped. It, it's very identifiable. The second thing is that um, the, the kind of history of DNA CPR was that at the point, there was a period where obviously people would, where CPR wasn't a possibility. When people's hearts stopped, they died. You couldn't do anything about it. Mm. And then when CPR started being considered to be something that you could revive someone from, at the very beginning, it was considered this kind of magic uh, revival. And it had very high success rates in those people in whom it was attempted, which was generally intraoperative cases um, where there was a clear reversible cause. So obviously CPR doesn't work in people where the heart stopping is the final point of a dying process, which is perhaps from organ failure or from frailty or from malignancy. Mm. And uh, indicating that ended up through a kind of historical process, really being this very marked red form on the front of patients' notes. And so then it gained this whole emotional significance for doctors and nurses and patients. Do they have a DNA CPR was a question that as a junior doctor, I was frequently asked on a Friday at the end of a shift because it was very obvious. Has this particular decision been made? Because you could look at a set of physical notes and see who had the red form and who didn't. So I think, I think it's, as I say, there's two reasons. One is it's a universal thing that we have to consider. And the other is this red piece of paper ended up getting primacy um, because it was very obvious to see whether the decision had been made or not. I think one striking point here is that the overall statistic of success rates from CPR hide the variation within, as you were mentioning. And I think there's a, a nice comparison between operative arrest, where, uh, to, to put it quite simply, the body has been stressed quite a lot by anaesthesia, for example, and that is seen to be a reversible one. And as you said, this um, deterioration in the final common path through of the dying process, where actually um, you could have two different, two very different groups of people and just bringing together all of the statistics on it. Um, really hides that if you don't have a, a discussion of the patient in front of you. Yeah, and actually, I think it's really misleading because even in, so for example, Compassion and Dying published a fantastic report yesterday about patients' attitudes towards DNA CPR. And even in that, they, they talk about um, the survival rate being about two in 10 patients surviving CPR. And that is two in 10 patients of those in whom CPR is attempted in hospital. Mm. But given that 80% of patients who die in hospital die with a DNA CPR or alternative recommendation, you know, respect or something in place, that two in 10 mm. is completely misleading. Because as you say, there are many, many people for whom the chance of them surviving CPR will be much less than 1%. Um, and I do think it's useful to dis distinguish the people whose heart stops because there's a sudden problem with the heart, the people whose heart stops because something clearly reversible has happened, like intraoperatively their potassium has gone too high or their blood pressure has gone too low or there's blood loss, whatever. And then those people whose heart stops as the final point of the dying process because they've got organ failure or frailty or cancer. And before moving on to some of these points, I wanted to also touch upon again how actually a DNA CPR can affect care um, in areas in which perhaps it's not designed to. And I was wondering how much of this do you think is a, a conscious um, kind of thought as you described some doctors 
slightly joking about it and saying, um, and saying, oh, actually, this is acknowledging that it's going to affect their treatment. And how much of it is perhaps more subconscious and how we go about studying really the effects, um, the effects of it? Sure. So uh, this is fascinating because I think you're right. I think some of it is, I think most of it is subconscious, actually. So I think if you asked, and in fact, I have asked doctors and nurses, what do you think DNA CPR should mean in terms of what treatment you give? They will say it shouldn't give, make any difference, except if their heart stops, you shouldn't attempt mm -hmm. CPR. That's what they say. That's what they know should be the case. And then if you ask them, what do other doctors do or what do nurses do? They say, well, there's a real problem because it gets misunderstood to mean that other care shouldn't be given. And there's a massive body of research that shows that if you have a DNA CPR, so there are lots of papers where they took uh, matched groups and they matched for all possible measurable variables, so age and comorbidities and functional status and all the rest of it. And having a DNA CPR was an independent indicator for, for example, not being accepted to ICU. And then on really simple measures for, for example, not being given anticoagulation if you had AF or not being started on an ACE inhibitor. Um, so really simple measures as well. Having a DNA CPR stopped doctors starting other treatments that were totally unrelated to whether or not their heart was going to stop. In addition to those studies that look at variables that are, can be controlled, you might say, well, maybe the DNA CPR is in some way indicating something that can't be measured that much. Maybe the patients with DNA CPR are sicker. We just don't know how to measure it. Maybe it's kind of an end of the bedogram. Okay, this mm. patient's really ill. So then there are some fantastic studies done. And Mary Beach is one of the people that did a, an early vignette study where she just took two identical vignettes. And the only difference was they said, this patient has a DNA CPR. And they gave them to doctors and said, what would you do? And just having that they have a DNA CPR radically changed what doctors said they would do in terms of giving blood transfusions, starting antibiotics, all kinds of things that, again, shouldn't be related to DNA CPR. So we actually did a, a kind of follow on from Mary Beach's study where we, we talked with her and we used her vignettes or adapted vignettes with a third example, which was the UFTO, where you clearly stated what the overall goal of care was. And we were able to show that the UFTO did address this subconscious bias. So by stating the overall goal of care is to try and get them better, but they're not for CPR, then uh, patient, doctors were willing to give patients blood transfusions and antibiotics. So it's about making sure that there's clarity about what the goal of care is that is separated from the DNA CPR decision. Otherwise, I think the problem is that DNA CPR gets conflated with is dying. And I wonder how change in language here from DNA CPR to respect changes how people view this and where you, where you kind of in your mind um, conscious and uh, aiming for actually just a shift in perceptions onto something new. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think there, there are two things with the, well, there were three things with the kind of, I guess, behavioral change in respect from DNA CPR. The first was, if we're going to have a label for a patient, we don't want them labeled by something you shouldn't do. In the ethnography on DNA CPR, we found that often in handover, because the DNA CPR was the first thing in the nursing handover sheet, nurses would say, the patient in B9 is DNA CPR. They have a pneumonia. Like the DNA CPR had primacy even over their diagnosis. And so we said, well, in that handover, we need to change things. We need to make sure that the goal of care is in the handover. And that's what happened with UFTO. We said we needed a kind of like a, an, a, a quick label where someone can say they're for active treatment, but not for CPR. So that was the first behavioral change was to say, you should never talk about their CPR status without also talking about their overall goal of care. The second thing was to say, yeah, the language and respect uh, took a long time to come up with that acronym. That was my eureka moment, I have to admit. <laughs> I was like, but it was a good, a good six months of writing random letters down and like circles and, um, so recommended summary plan for emergency care and treatment does what it says on the tin, but it is also about respecting patient preferences and respecting clinical judgment. So it's, it's actually, I think, a two-way thing. Um, and it's about saying that any conversation you have has to be respectful. Uh, so yes, that was very conscious uh, bit of medical, um, medical marketing. I don't know what to call it, but a bit of, you know, a little bit of thinking about how, how this is going to be used. Um, and then the third thing was about saying that this shared understanding language, that this is not about a clinical decision being imposed upon a patient. It's about achieving shared understanding together, 
which is different than um, shared decision making, I think, because I don't think it's necessarily a shared decision because there are circumstances where obviously a patient can't demand to be full CPR if a clinician doesn't think they'll benefit from it. So it's not kind of, I don't think it's shared decision making in the same way, for example, shared decision making about whether you have one type of surgery or another might be made. There's not hmm. equipoise. And I wonder too whether actually this is a shift towards perhaps slightly more complexity regarding um, a respect form versus a DNA CPR, which the letters DNA CPR really sum it up as a binary as a binary thing, whereas actually respect doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what to do in a situation. Mm. You actually have to dive into there and it, it forces um, a certain acceptance of an individual patient and the complexity, even for people who are quite time pressured, for example. Yeah, no, you're right. So you couldn't, just because you know someone has a respect form, you actually have no idea what the content of that form is. In fact, they could be for CPR on a respect form. It is about the fact that they've had the conversation rather than about the outcome. I think this this conversation wouldn't really be complete without touching upon some of the, I guess, poor outcomes of CPR where it is perhaps inappropriate. Um, and I think that's <laughs> one thing that perhaps amongst the public, it can be slightly slightly misconceived that actually CPR as with any medical treatment, has negative as well as um, potentially positive consequences to it. I was wondering if you could touch upon that a bit. Yeah, so I think the, the whole reason that DNA CPRs exist, which we touched upon earlier in terms of you know, recognising they weren't going to be of benefit to people, it's not just that it won't work. Because in a way, arguably, you could say, well, if it isn't going to work, then what's the harm in trying? Like, you know, no, if, if, it, if the patient has essentially died and you attempt CPR and you don't revive them, then the patient's none, none the worse for knowing. So why don't we just try? I think In terms of mortality, some... things are only positive from there. Right. But of course, mortality um, isn't the only thing that matters. Well, ex exactly. But actually, even, even from the mortality. So I think the, in a way, the worst case scenario, and unfortunately, I have been present myself as a, as a registrar and as an SHO at, at several such arrests where someone's heart had stopped uh, there was no DNA CPR in place. CPR had been started and then the patient's heart started pumping again. I will never know whether those patients were able to take in really what they saw around them, which was a big arrest team, you know, pumping on their chest and doing all kinds of things. But then it stops because actually it, it, it's unable to, to, their heart stops again because it's unable to be sustained. Or uh, they get intubated, the intensive care team comes and the intensive care team says this person will never survive a period on intensive care and then you have to withdraw that. So essentially for those people, I think that's a that's significant harm because they went from having a peaceful death to having a very traumatic death. Um, and I think that has, uh, that, that is, well, that's unethical for them. It also causes moral injury to the staff who are undertaking a futile and potentially harmful um, uh, intervention to that patient and and actually all the patients in the bay who who are aware of this happening like there are other consequences for other people mm. so that's one poor outcome which is I, I found heartbreaking and I found it very difficult also for the family then to, to not be able to tell them that their relative had, had a peaceful death although sometimes hearing that these have been attempted but, but sometimes patients relatives are very unhappy um, quite understandably and I think reasonably so that futile efforts have been made after someone died um, but then the, the other thing that can happen is that CPR can be quote unquote successful in, in that you have a spontaneous return of circulation and you go to intensive care for a period because you don't, you don't want to get spontaneous circulation. You don't just sit up and have a cup of tea and say, thank you, unless it's a VF rest, in which case you can sometimes thump someone and literally be okay. But that's another scenario. So in general, after CPR, um, you, you have some period on intensive care. And um, you often can have ended up with a period without sufficient oxygenation. And so you end up with a very poor neurological outcome. And uh, that is a not infrequent scenario with CPR, which is why understanding what a patient's outcomes are that they value and that they fear is so important. Because if you know that what someone really fears is a poor neurological outcome, you can protect them from that. At the same time, as you mentioned earlier, we do have this, this situation in which somebody cannot demand a treatment that is deemed to be or have very, very low chances um, of success. I was wondering about um, whether or how frequently actually there are disagreements within care teams, ultimately, even when things have been explained, um, where actually a patient is 
much more enthusiastic for um, even knowing um, the information about outcomes, for example, um, a treatment that actually uh, the doctors caring for them do not think would be in their interests and has a very low chance of being successful? I think that's a really, really good question. And I think it happens more frequently with relatives wanting their loved one to stay alive than it does an individual saying, I want to stay alive in all circumstances. So personally, I haven't come across a patient where I've gone through that process of saying um, a shared understanding of what's the problems of the patient, shared understanding of outcomes. And when I get to that point, the patient says, I want to stay alive no matter what, no matter what state I'm in, keep me going. I personally haven't had that. And I think if I did come across it, I would pause there and I would try really hard to understand why that was, because it would be such an unusual scenario for me. If they said, look, this is just the way it is. I have very strong beliefs that life is sacrosanct, sacrosanct and I need you to do everything you can to keep me alive no matter what. I would probably explain that as a physician, I need to consider what treatments will work and um, that my belief was that CPR wouldn't work. Let's imagine that's a, the scenario mm. that we're in because, for example, their heart had very poor function and they had kidney failure. And let's paint a really bleak picture so that I'm in a really strong prognosticating uh, you know, scenario. And I would then say, look, I need to get a second opinion. Um, and um, I would give that person the opportunity to, to talk to someone else. Um, and if we both believe that that patient wouldn't benefit from further treatments and by benefit, I mean, we were concerned it would cause them, um, it would be un unlikely to be, or extremely unlikely to be successful, then uh, we, would we would have to explain to them that ultimately this is a medical decision in the law and um, that uh, they were free to, to seek further legal advice if they wanted to. But I would like to put that all in the massive couching of, in my you know, 20 years of practice, I have yet to have that encounter. And that I think the way to avoid confrontation in that encounter is to make sure that you've really taken your time before you get to a conversation about CPR, understanding what the patient values. So you then can talk about what treatments will benefit them. And that process is important, not just in the clinical decision-making process, but in the establishing trust process. Because you as a doctor have actually taken the time to find out what, what the patient values. And um, therefore the patient has a reason to trust you that you will be doing what's in their interest instead of randomly picking some like clinical judgment from, from, from thin air. Mm. And to what extent um, do you think it's important, well, or necessary to involve people's families in, in decision making? Because I, I see a number of, I guess, conflicting um, outcomes potentially here, working out whether they are acting in a patient's best interests, um, but then also at the other um, extent of things, not putting too much pressure on them if they feel that they are making a decision on behalf of um, their patient. I think there's an interesting distinction here. Absolutely. So where a patient has capacity, I would always start just having the conversation with the patient. Um, I sometimes ask them if they would like me to talk with a family member. And sometimes they, they want to. And actually, as an aside on the respect process form, um, there have been uh, patients who have asked for a place for them to put their signature on the form. So although there's no need for a patient signature or a relative signature, some people have wanted to in order to be able to show their families that they were involved in the conversation, mm. which is interesting. We haven't, we haven't actually seen it used very much, but it's there should people want it. Mm. Um, where a patient lacks capacity, you're right, there's a very fine line, uh, fine line, there's a very careful um, line to be tread um, in terms of making sure you involve the relatives or those close to the patient in order to understand what that patient would have valued as part of the Mental Capacity Act in terms of really trying to establish what would be in their best interests. Um, and then saying to them, and so what I say is, uh, in order for me to make a decision for your relative, friend, whatever, that is in their best interests, I really need to understand what you think they would have wanted or what they value. Again, we, I talk about outcomes. I don't ever ask about particular treatments, what outcomes they value, what outcomes they'd fear, in order for be, me to be able to make a medical decision about whether they would benefit from going to intensive care or having CPR attempted. And I really use that language of, 
I need to talk to you about your understanding of the relative in order for me to make a clinical decision. Does that answer your... Mm, yes. Yeah. I was thinking as well about um, this, they, they can often be uh, seen as this divide between, okay, a patient's interests and a family's interests. And I was wondering how you think about actually a patient's interest, which is their family and their own well-being. And it often strikes me as um, sometimes when I read about articles on this or people talking about it saying actually you need to stop the family's kind of own interests playing a role here whereas actually in in lots of cases it strikes me as strange that somebody who has perhaps spent their entire life caring for their family would not want that to play a role ultimately in dictating the the nature of their death in the end i absolutely agree i don't know if you know i've written a, a paper called Can Best Interests Derail the Trolley, specifically looking at whether the best interests of an individual extends beyond their own individual well-being and to that of their family. So um, in that quite uh, forced scenario, because it was like a, a hypothetical scenario, a mother throws herself in front of an oncoming truck to protect her son. Mm. And no one would object to that, right? Everyone has the right to put their risk their lives to save a family member. Um, and in this paper, I go on to create a scenario where essentially the son needs an organ, but the mother doesn't have capacity to donate it. Mm. And so could you take her kidney, which um, would be fine. She's got two of those to give the son. Actually, in law at the moment, no, but you could absolutely argue that that's in her best interest because she has already demonstrated that her best interests extend beyond her bodily integrity. Like she couldn't have demonstrated it any harder than yes, throwing absolutely. it in front of the um, and then go on to say, because this is about kind of prolonged disorders of consciousness, well, let's say that her injury from the truck was that she had really severe uh, brain injury and clinically assisted nutrition hydration is going to be withdrawn with the inevitable consequence of her death. Could in that context, her liver be given to her son? Because again, that would be a best interest decision if you look at best interest extending beyond the patient. So I am really interested in this idea. And I think we, in our best interest decisions, we identify people too much as just being an individual in terms of the law that's that is how the law is and so as medics we have to work within the constraints of the law but i think as ethicists we can really question that and i think in terms of what patients say and this is why it's so important to have a conversation with patients when they still have capacity Patient statements that they don't want a lingering death often go hand in hand with the idea that they don't want to be a burden to their families. And there's a big kind of um, literature and movement that this is something we should, we should avoid, that people shouldn't ever not want treatments because they're scared of being a burden. But actually, I think there's an alternative argument, which is that that desire not to be a burden should also be respected and considered. If people want to not have that life, because they want their families not to have to look after them. That is, that, that, so long as it's not been a pressurized decision, that is a, a, a decision as valuable as any other decision. Mm. And I think that's a remarkably common scenario that is faced in medicine, whereas um, sometimes we think about these ethical issues and we can think of strange, weird, wacky scenarios, um, not to be harsh on them, but um, actually this no, no, is no, something I that we see- up my mother <laughs> throwing, a woman throwing herself at the bus, but yeah. <laughs> um, this is something that we see playing out all the time and almost to, to fail to acknowledge that it is a scenario that's playing out um, is perhaps the worst of the, of the options um, that we have going forwards. I, I, I think you're right and I think we should perhaps be doing some empirical work at asking people what they feel about the relationship between them and their families and how that should be included in making a best interest decision. Because otherwise we are second guessing both ways. We're saying, oh, well, this should be valued, this shouldn't be valued. But mm. actually perhaps what we need is some empirical work on, you know, people in their 90s who are concerned about being a burden. You know, what can we do to address that concern? Um, and is it, is it a concern that we have created uh, on them or um, pushed on them? Or is it a, is it a concern that um, just needs to be respected? I had a fantastic, this is an anecdote, but um, I had a fantastic 92 or 93 year old uh, lady come into A&E who was completely independent, who had what turned out to be a pulmonary embolism, which was diagnosed very quickly in within the four hours of A&E pre-COVID. And uh, I'd been in discussion with 
the junior doctor I was working with while she was being diagnosed. And I went with the junior doctor because I had said to him, if she's really independent, I think she can go home from A&E. We'll just anticoagulate her. She doesn't need admission. I mean, that's amazing. So we went up to her quite cock a hoop and said, you know, we've got a diagnosis, you've got a pulmonary embolism and we can treat that just with tablets. And I think you can go home today. And she said, tell me, what is one allowed to die from these days? <laughs> <laughs> it was this kind of sense of, you know, I always think I caught, caught myself by surprise because I am obviously on the far end of making sure I know whether patients want treatment or not. But in my mind, you know, starting someone anticoagulation was a no brainer, like for a, a life saving anticoagulation. But she was like, I just, you know, she just wanted to be able, she didn't really want, she, didn't, she, she took it in the end. But, um, I love this idea of what is one allowed to die from these days. And I think we should address that as well. I think this idea of prolonging life because we assume that's what everyone wants clearly needs to be questioned. And going back a little bit, I think we have an interesting situation when we bring in talking to families about their interests. Um, because I imagine that um, it's this to and fro situation where actually um, patients' families are probably, in many cases, very unwilling to accept a sacrifice from their their, their relative in order to... I think improve their quality of life for example and it's it's kind of been ingrained within us almost to um <laughs> the refusal the refusal of help and gifts and in a way actually have one one group not accepting something that could benefit them and, and one group actually genuinely really wanting to give that and working out um actually yeah. what the true motivations are here is very difficult it's almost a vicious virtuous cycle isn't it because it's uh it's and in fact there was a, a study in the states I've, I've lost the name of the person who did it, but I can look it up later, where they asked um, patients on intensive care what they thought the relatives would say they wanted and what they wanted. And they correctly guessed that the relatives would say that they wanted more treatments than they did. So it's quite a nice, uh, you know, that relatives are assuming that they will, that, that the patients know the relatives will say go for more than they do. Mm, that's really interesting. And slightly tying all of this together, um, we've done quite a lot on the podcast about research methods and how we how we answer questions like this. And this is a very um, actually different scenario to the normal one that we touched upon looking at drug approvals, for example. Um, but I was wondering how how you go about studying what what a good decision actually is um, when um, this is something I talked about in another podcast that should be released soon on uncertainty. When actually the the parameters, the clinical endpoints as such that we use are, are very different from normal ones of mortality, for example. For, I, think, I think it is obviously more challenging. And I think we need to be careful not just to do research on questions where we can easily measure things, because then we might be missing out some of the important things uh, that are really important to patients. But we also need to be careful not to construct kind of false measures in a hope of, so you're saying, what is a good decision? Mm. If I can go, if I can go back a step and say for the CPR work that we did, the respect after respect work, uh -huh. we definitely used mixed methods because there was quite a lot of, uh, there were objective measures. So are we changing the actual care patients get? So all of that stuff I told you about scenario experiments and, um, um, in terms of looking at outcomes of patients with DNA CPRs and without them. There were some yeah. hard outcome measures you could look at. But then we also did some ethnography. So we actually watched what nurses and doctors were doing in terms of their interactions with patients and their interactions with each other. And then when we introduced an intervention, how did that change? And um, we did questionnaires, which is obviously self-reporting, but it's still relevant. It still gave us some indication. And the, the questionnaires was also interesting in terms of behavior because we could ask questions uh, about what patients and what doctors and nurses did and then what they thought other doctors and nurses did, which was often more revealing in terms of <laughs> what standard practice was. Um, but in terms of kind of what is the right decision, I am obviously doing empirical ethics in general. And I think that that requires looking at all of the stakeholders who are involved in that decision making mm. and understanding what they value. So I think you need to do start with some qualitative work where you establish who is affected by the decision. So in this case, it will be the patient, it will be the relatives, it will be the doctors, it will be the nurses. Um, there may be policymakers as well who are affected in terms of resource allocation, let's say, or the resource officers. Um, you need to look at uh, how it will affect people from secondary care and in primary care because patients are going back and forth. So you need to think about, I think the massive first step is thinking about all, I mean, stakeholders are such a 
business term, isn't it? But I mean, all the different people who are affected mm. by this decision. And then you need to ask quite open questions about what they think the current status quo is and how they think they might be affected by a change in status quo. And then you introduce your change and then you ask similar questions. So you're still doing a before and after, but you're getting some qualitative data from that. And in that qualitative data, if you're lucky, you might then also come up with a hard outcome measure. So with respect, um, there is like a way of assessing. So we talked about trust. I think trust is it's not hard. This is not, we're not in the hard outcome measures yet. We're now in the <laughs> quasi. <laughs> but in terms of whether you're having a conversation with a patient that engenders um, well-placed trust in the doctor, there's quite a big difference between a DNA CPR conversation and respect conversation. You could, you could measure that. You could um, then look at uh, some, I'm now into the hard outcome measures, whether you get readmission to hospital in 30 days um, or whether you get, um, uh, um, I was about to say respected views on where the person wants to be if they were to deteriorate. So if someone says, I would like to die at home, does documenting it on a respect form actually correlate with that? Mm. So I think you have to go, I think you have to run the gamut of soft, qualitative, what do people, what do people consider to be the right decision? And you have to make sure you've done all the stakeholders. You need to do the kind of middle things and you need to find some validated questionnaires on how it affects patient perceptions of trust or patient perceptions of whether they have been respected. And then you try from all of that interview data to pull out some hard outcome measures. Because actually, if you're going to instigate something, especially if it's going to cost money, um, you need to be able to show some data on how it works. Looking at the, some of the situations in which perhaps a conversation um, might not be in a patient's best interests, what sort of scenarios um, could come up here? And how do you think those are, are dealt with? And this is on the back of... Um, reports from the CQC, which you um, touched upon um, earlier in the podcast, that showed kind of rather shockingly that a lot of patients had not been consulted about um, CPR decisions in the ways that they um, quite evidently should have been. I think the law is really clear on this. You only don't have a conversation about CPR with a patient who has capacity if you think it will cause physiological or psychological harm. And I think those situations are situations where, for example, if you had someone who was extremely breathless and had an anxiety disorder and you were worried was deteriorating to the point that they were going to have a respiratory arrest, mm. I think you could make an argument that it would cause physiological harm to start having a conversation about CPR at that moment. That's kind of the only scenario I can think of where it would cause physiological okay. harm. <laughs> psychological harm is obviously more nuanced and I would recommend to anyone that they got a second opinion before they thought that that having a CPR discussion would cause psychological harm, particularly because some of the work we did right at the beginning showed that where doctors thought it was going to distress the patient, actually not having the discussion was more distressing. So there were patients sitting on the ward in mm. whom a DNA CPR had been written who were worried that CPR would be attempted on them. And they didn't know the doctor had already made the DNA CPR. So I would be very cautious about psychological harm. In a patient who lacks capacity, um, you must, the law again is really clear, you must talk to someone close to them unless it is impracticable or inappropriate to do so, I think is the legal language. And um, the only context, again, I can think of where that is the case. So essentially, if a patient is getting very sick, you should be calling the family anyway, or those close to them, because they're getting sick. So I say A, B, C, D, E, F, F is phone the family, make sure someone's calling them. It's often the only difference you can make to a patient or their you know, if you're not going to be able to help them survive, at least you can make sure they're with someone when they die. Um, so A, B, C, D, F. So you should be phoning the family anyway if they're deteriorating. But if the patient who is deteriorating doesn't have a contact, like they've come in as a trauma, then clearly it's impracticable to contact someone. Or if the only known relative of the patient is too far away to get there in time, unable to speak on the phone to the patient, and... Uh, for example, I've, I've had a context of someone who was in a different time zone and I didn't, and very elderly, I wrote, I thought it was inappropriate if it was an 80 something year old and her sister lived in somewhere else. I wrote in the notes, I thought it was inappropriate to wake this person to have a CPR conversation with them. That's the only context that I can think of. I'm just thinking that um, perhaps there can be this confusion between people suspecting that 
a CPR discussion would cause distress, whereas in actual fact it's the CPR discussion not carried out in an appropriate way that is causing distress, rather than just the mere um, fact that the discussion has been had, and actually that accounts for more of the cases than actually these rare scenarios that you've been describing. Exactly, exactly. And um, this fear, I think it is a quite arrogant fear of doctors, actually, that people won't have thought about the possibility that they might be dying or that their heart might stop someday. And I think it's a bit cowardly of doctors to say, I won't have this. So to be arrogant and cowardly at the same time is a pretty bad combination. And I'm sorry to malign some of our colleagues, but I think to not have that conversation is suggesting that the patient hasn't thought of it themselves and that it will upset them. And actually the reverse is true. Normally people know that uh, they may well die. Well, everyone knows they'll die one day. And so having, having a conversation about CPR shouldn't be so terrifying. One of the things I, I said about UFTO and respect and in Addenbrooke's where we work, we actually have this conversation with everyone within 72 hours of their admission because we're trying to destigmatize it. Because I do think it probably is quite scary if the first time you have the conversation is when you get really sick or if you've never had the conversation mm. before and someone comes up and starts talking to you about CPR, like, hmm, do you know something I don't know? Whereas if, as I do, you say to everyone, we have this conversation on the mission with everyone. Um, and if you came in, I would say something much simpler. I would say there are all kinds of treatments we can offer you in hospital. I assume you would want to be considered for all of them, including CPR. Like I don't go through the whole shared understanding of, of your situation because clearly you don't have a chronic illness right now. So that, there is a kind of quick way, but what it does is it destigmatizes the idea that you'll be having these conversations from a very early point. And I think that's a, a nice way of um, touching upon the probabilistic questions that people might have about um, about CPR, or is it sensible to have a conversation with somebody as it as the probability of it being required dwindles down lower and lower and lower? And I know I've certainly faced, I don't think I've faced a situation where I've knowingly caused a patient distress by discussing something, but I know I've, I have um, shied away from discussing certain things for fear of causing distress and have been told later on, actually, you should have brought that up. Um, mm. And I guess part of my worry was bringing something up that actually was not particularly significant or was very unlikely but, but I think there's a, a yeah I guess I think there's a responsibility societally for us to be bringing this up so that we're not frightened of having the conversations when it is relevant so I think you're almost laying the ground groundwork for starting someone thinking about it and and even if you know that it's not relevant right now the fact that you've laid it means first of all it won't be so challenging when you talk about it later and secondly maybe they'll go away and have a think about what outcomes they really value and what they fear. And it will be part of the thinking that they might, you know, discussion that they might have with their family. Um, I, I've had some patients say that to me, you know, oh, I went away and I thought about it and I wasn't going to, but I'm, you know, I'm glad I did now. Mm. And do you think that the pandemic has changed um, both doctors and public perceptions um, of these discussions and these decisions to any extent? So I'm sure the pandemic has, but I actually think the culture change was happening long before the pandemic. So uh, Respect has been around for a few years now, and it has been remarkable to me in, say, five years. Obviously, we have patients coming into hospital recurrently, and they are now expecting to have this conversation. So it was a very quick culture change. Um, I think the, uh, the coronavirus has obviously made us all more aware of our mortality, but also of intensive care and ventilators, because that has been so much in the news. And I think actually people just mm. weren't really familiar with that. So that makes that part of the conversation much more accessible because people have now, lots of people had never seen a picture of someone on a ventilator before this year. And actually it's, I think that that's made that much more accessible. Mm. But I think the conversation about CPR, about mortality, about respect, I think that all started pre-pandemic. Mm. probably to finish off with because i'm aware of time we've we've talked quite a lot about how actually patients in hospital um going through this process can really um demystify it and um deal with some misconceptions um surrounding end of life care and escalation of care in terms of the general public's understanding um, of what is happening here before people come even come into hospital and um perhaps being applied to relatives um, as well who might not be directly liaising with doctors involved in someone's care. What progress do you think we need to make in this respect? 
Public engagement is my next step, really, for respect. That's what I think has to happen. So I think people should be considering this long before they come into hospital. People should be considering what it is that they value in terms of health outcomes and what it is they fear in terms of health outcomes and initiating the conversations with their GPs uh, so that people can be protected from treatments that they don't want. Because actually, as doctors, we knee-jerk my story about the anticoagulation is a perfect example, except that it was she didn't want it. But we knee jerk give people treatments without considering whether they want them or not. Mm. And so I think um, empowering patients to have these thoughts and these conversations before they're under a time pressure and a sickness pressure in hospital is really important. And saying, you are one half of this conversation. This is not a medical decision that's being imposed on you. This is about establishing shared understanding between a patient and a clinician. And in order to do that, you need to have given this some thought beforehand. And here are the kind of things that you can think about. Um, and that way we can, we can understand what it is you want and we can make sure we respect those views. And I suppose this earlier decision making and thinking about it actually allows decisions that perhaps take a lot more time to put through. For example, somebody who comes into the emergency department and um, spends some time in a ward and actually... Um, you find out there that they would rather pass away at home. That's more difficult to solve than the question of whether they would like CPR or not. And actually, if that decision, if that discussion had been had earlier, um, yeah. then actually it might be that vents could be yeah could pave the way for actually the really meeting their long term kind of interests. Absolutely. So talking about not just CPR then, and I hope I hope I think we've both made that clear that this isn't just about talking about CPR. Yes. It's talking about overall goals of care, which can include not even coming into hospital or what are the contexts in which you would want to come into hospital and actually as an as an aside um the ambulance clinicians and paramedics are really grateful for respect because in the past they had this very blunt tool we were talking i started at the very beginning with my mm. writing all over this blunt tool and it's too blunt for a paramedic they come out to the, the house and all they have is a dna cpr they have no way of knowing whether that patient wants to go into hospital and um, or what treatments should be given to them at home um, so it's been quite helpful to be able to give some direction to them as well. I think we could go on for talk, talking for hours about this um, because it's such a fascinating topic. Um, but thank you so much for uh, joining me on the podcast and um, no. discussing all of this. My absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for interviewing so beautifully. It's great. It's a great privilege to have talked with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Pager podcast. If you've enjoyed it, do leave us a review, share it with a friend and come back to listen to our other episodes. As ever, we'd love to hear what you think. You can reach us at Pager Podcast on Instagram and Twitter or email us at pagerpodcast at gmail.com. Bye for now.